these two pilots are flying an Airbus A330 across the Atlantic Ocean. It's a journey that they have done hundreds of times. It's the middle of the night and four hours have passed since they left Canada. Everything looks normal and the pilots are in an upbeat mood and the passengers are asleep. But then suddenly, out of nowhere, they just run out of fuel. Now put yourself in their shoes. What would you do if you lost both your engines and all you see around you is darkness and you're over 120 kilometers away from the nearest airport? How would you save the lives of 306 people on board? This is not just a story of an air traffic incident. It's a story of human psychology, negligence, process failure, and skilled airmanship. This is the story of Air Transat Flight 236. Toronto, Canada. It's August 23rd, 2001. Air Transat Flight 236 is a scheduled transatlantic flight from Pearson International Airport to Lisbon's Portela Airport in Portugal. 293 passengers, mostly tourists and holidaymakers, and 13 crew were preparing for their seven-hour journey. This flight would depart Toronto and fly over Halifax, St. John's, and then begin its Atlantic crossing to cover the remaining five hours before landing in Lisbon. The plane for the incident flight was a two-year-old Airbus A330. It first flew with Air Transat in 1999. The flight was powered by two powerful Rolls-Royce Trent 772 Bravo engines. The commander for this flight was 48-year-old Captain Robert Pichet. He had accumulated over 16,800 hours over his 20-year flying career. And he had around 800 hours of flying time on the A330. He was the pilot flying this leg. Pilot monitoring was First Officer Dirk de Jagger. At 28 years old, he had a total flying experience of 4,800 hours with around 400 hours on the type. At the time of the incident, Air Transat had been in operation for around 14 years and had an excellent safety record. And they've never had a fatal accident or the loss of an aircraft thus far. But this safety record is going to change today. The crew unloaded 46,900 kilos of fuel for their flight across the Atlantic. This was 4,500 kilos above the minimum requirement. The crew filed the flight plan, requested pushback, taxi to the runway, and then departed Toronto at 0052 UTC. Although the A330 was fully computerized, standard operating procedure required that the crew manually calculate their direction, distance, and fuel remaining on board at every waypoint. The crew completed these checks as the flight crossed waypoints at 50 degrees west and then at 40 degrees west. At 4.57 UTC, approximately four hours after takeoff, the plane was crossing 30 degrees west and it was time to complete the checklist again. We are at 30 west. FCOM check, please. Fuel on board is 21.6 tons. It's within 1% of expected values, Captain. Fuel check complete. But, unbeknownst to the pilots, something disastrous was already unfolding within their airplane. Six minutes later, at 5.03 UTC, the crew got an unusual warning on their screens. Captain, there's something wrong with engine two. Low oil quantity, high oil pressure, and low oil temperature readings. Number one is looking fine though. Oil temperatures usually only go up, they don't go down. A low oil temperature reading normally means that they have a bad sensor. High oil pressure is also a very rare scenario and most pilots go their whole career without seeing this. And when this happens, it usually indicates that the oil is contaminated with fuel. But unfortunately, this isn't explained in the A330 manual. This doesn't make sense. Let's contact maintenance. Maybe they'll know what to do. Mirabel Center, Transat 236. We have a problem. 
We have a warning on the E-CAM for low oil temps and high oil pressure for engine number two. I don't see anything in the FCOM or the QRH. Can you help? But the maintenance crew weren't able to help find the root cause either. They guided the pilots to keep monitoring the oil levels. Now this is where human psychology starts playing a part. Because the readings were so unusual, and because the left engine's readings were completely fine, and also because low oil temperature readings are usually the result of a faulty sensor, the pilots thought that what they were seeing was just a computer glitch, and that their plane was actually fine. And so they decided to keep going. Now to understand the rest of the story, you'll need to understand how the fuel tanks work in an Airbus A330. The A330 holds the fuel in the wings. There's a tank on the left wing that usually feeds the left engine. And there's a tank on the right wing that usually feeds the right engine. There's also a trim tank in the horizontal stabilizers. The purpose of the trim tank is to maintain the aircraft's center of gravity at all times. As the flight burns fuel, the weight of the flight near the wings reduces. This would make the back of the plane heavier pushing the center of gravity further back. And when this happens, the airplane's computers will automatically push fuel from the trim tank to the wing tanks to maintain the center of gravity. During this transfer, the pilots will see a trim tank transfer message on screen. And once the transfer completes, a trim tank transferred message would show on screen. This is normal and happens routinely on every flight. While the flight crew were investigating the unusual oil readings, the trim tank transfer system automatically began a transfer of all the remaining fuel from the trim tank to the wing tanks. The trim tank transfer message was displayed on screen. But remember, the trim tank transfer happens on every flight. And here's where a second example of human psychology and decision making plays a part. Because the pilots are used to seeing this message on every flight, they thought that this was a routine display and didn't pay too much heed to it. What they failed to realize was that the trim tank transfer happened an entire one hour before it should have happened. What the pilots hadn't realized was that there was a major fuel leak within their right engine. A week prior to the incident flight, maintenance staff at Air Transat identified an unrelated issue with the original right engine of this plane, and hence, decided to replace it with a different one. But because Air Transat didn't have a spare, Rolls-Royce loaned them a spare engine. However, the loaned engine was of an older variant compared to what the plane required. Due to the differences in the variants, the fuel tube and the hydraulic tube wouldn't fit properly. But the maintenance staff forced a clearance between the two tubes and then approved the engine for normal use. The engine was fitted back on the flight and after flying 68 hours over the course of a week and when the plane was over the middle of the Atlantic, the fuel pump ruptured. The fuel leak had started at 4.38 UTC and fuel had been leaking for over 30 minutes at this point. But as the fuel was leaking, the trim tank was automatically filling the right tank up to maintain the center of gravity and hence the pilots were unaware of the fuel leak. Their next manual check of the fuel quantity would have been at 20 degrees west, which was still 20 minutes away. Due to the leak, the quantity of fuel on the right tank was depleting faster than the left tank. But when the last trim tank transfer happened, it transferred all the remaining fuel to the right tank. And so, as the fuel leak continued, there was no more fuel to top up. At 5.33 UTC, a fuel imbalance advisory message was displayed on the ECAM screen. It was only at this time that the flight crew became aware of the imbalance between the left and the right fuel tanks. But remember, they still haven't considered the possibility of a fuel leak here. A fuel leak is a very rare scenario. Confirmation bias is starting to play a part. They've already convinced themselves that there's a glitch with the computers. For the crew, the fuel imbalance and the fuel quantity indications were unusual and unexplainable, further convincing themselves that this was just a computer error and that the fuel quantity was actually fine on their plane. The crew's initial response to the fuel imbalance message 
was to cross feed the fuel from the left tank to the right tank to maintain balance. The captain completed this step from memory, but what he forgot was that the checklist had a warning that the cross feed step should not be carried out if a fuel leak is suspected. But unfortunately, that got ignored. The cross feed, of course, didn't fix the issue. A few minutes later, the crew calculated that the fuel remaining on board was just 11,000 kilos. They should have had 20,000 kilos at this point. It's probably just a glitch. Let's keep monitoring. These pilots had not previously encountered a fuel leak or an unexplained low fuel quantity warning, neither in real life nor in training. They're going to have to figure things out on their own. The fuel quantity continued to drop as they kept flying towards Portugal. At 5.45 UTC, the crew calculated that they no longer had enough fuel to reach Lisbon and decided to divert the plane to Lages Airport in the Azores. At 5.48, the crew advised ATC that the flight was diverting due to a fuel shortage and that they only had 7,000 kilos of fuel left. The captain asked the lead cabin crew to conduct a visual check of the engines and wings for any evidence of a fuel leak. Now in daytime, a fuel leak would be extremely obvious to see. But in the middle of the night, it was next to impossible to identify. The cabin crew returned to the pilots and said that, I don't see a leak or condensation on the wings, Captain. Okay, it's likely just a computer error, but we've diverted to Lodges Airport. The captain then told her to prepare the cabin for a landing, but most likely for a ditching in the Atlantic Ocean. The fuel on board was rapidly decreasing and was now at 4,800 kilos, 12,000 kilos less than what was planned. And 10 minutes later, at 6.13 UTC, when the aircraft was at flight level 390 and 250 kilometers from La Jays, the right engine flamed out. Two minutes later, the fuel reduced further to 600 kilograms. The first officer declared a mayday Air with Trans ATC. Air 236. We are declaring an emergency. We have lost our number two engine. The Airbus A330 has an ETOPS 180 rating, meaning it can fly on a single engine for up to 180 minutes, more than enough time for Air Transat 236 to reach the Azores. As long as nothing else goes wrong, the crew will be able to land this plane safely. But when the flight was 120 kilometers away from the runway, the left engine flamed out as well. The roaring sound of the engines was now replaced with an eerie silence. Oxygen mass dropped due to the loss of pressurization and the ram turbine was deployed to provide electrical power for critical instruments. With no power, Air Transat Flight 236 was now just a glider. You know how hard it is to turn your car's steering wheel when the engine is switched off? That's because your engine provides power for your power steering to work. And that's how sluggish the control surfaces of this plane are feeling for Captain Pichet. Commander Pichet had one chance to get this aircraft on the ground. He needs to now be very careful how he flies this plane. If he flew about 200 knots, he wouldn't be able to lower the landing gear. If he flew under 140 knots, the ram turbine wouldn't generate power. And if he made any mistake in his calculations, he'll end up in the water. Assisted by military air traffic controllers and radar vectors from Lages ATC, the crew carried out an engines out visual approach. The weather was fine, so they had that going for them. The aircraft was descending at about 2000 feet per minute and the crew calculated that they had about 15 to 20 minutes left before they would be forced to ditch in the ocean. To help identify where the airport was, the crew asked the ATC to constantly flash the runway lights on and off. At 6.31 UTC, the aircraft arrived at 8 miles off the end of the runway at approximately 13,000 feet. Unfortunately, they were too high to make it. The captain had to find a way to lose altitude fast. He made the hard decision 
to turn the plane around and do a 360 degree to lose altitude. If he got this wrong, they'd end up in the Atlantic Ocean right under them. He successfully completed the 360 degree turn, but unfortunately, he was still too high to reach the airport. So during the final approach, he conducted a series of S-turns to increase the distance covered and to lose additional altitude. The plane is now just a couple of miles away from the runway. Captain Pichet has one chance to land this plane. There are no do-overs, there are no go-arounds. This is it. The most important landing is done thus far. Just prior to the landing, the first officer issued a brace, brace, brace command. At 6.45, the plane crossed the threshold of runway 33 at around 200 knots. They were landing so fast that the plane hit the ground and then bounced back up in the air. The captain didn't want to get airborne again, so he forced the stick down to push the plane back on the runway and then applied maximum brake. The plane came to a stop 2,000 feet from the end of the runway. Due to the force of the landing, the landing gear ruptured and small fires started near the left main gear wheels. Emergency response vehicles at the scene quickly extinguished the fires. The captain ordered an emergency evacuation and 14 passengers and two crew members received minor injuries. Two other passengers received severe injuries during the evacuation. The final report identified the root cause as poor maintenance practices by Air Transat's maintenance staff. It also pinned the flight crew for not recognizing that a fuel leak existed and for carrying out a fuel imbalance procedure checklist from memory. The report stated that had the captain completed the fuel leak checklist when the first indications of a leak showed up, the plane would have reached Azores with fuel remaining on board. Air Transat accepted responsibility and was fined 250,000 Canadian dollars for the accident, which at the time was the largest fine in Canadian history. Captain Pichet was awarded the Superior Airmanship Award in 2002 for his extraordinary feat of gliding a passenger aircraft without engines for nearly 120 kilometers. It's the furthest anyone has ever done it. Now, if you like this video, here's another story of how a much newer Boeing 777 lost all navigation instruments and was stuck in the clouds, unable to land in New York City. I'll see you there.